Good afternoon and welcome to Pincus Co. Live. Today we're speaking with two individuals about one of the most critical tasks for any buyer, seller, or broker, which is to correctly establish pricing. The market is in an unusual period where many of the underlying tools used to establish pricing are themselves in flux, including interest rates, regulations, and a sharply rising rental market that can't keep going up by 20% a year and maybe starting to flatten. To get an idea about how to establish a price in the current environment, we're speaking with investor David Shornstein, who with over 15 years of experience has bought and sold more than 250 properties and is now a principal with the investment firm Hildreth Real Estate Advisors. And we're also speaking with Brandon Polakoff, a principal and executive director at the brokerage firm Avis & Young. He has been involved in sales with an aggregate value of over $3 billion. I'm Adam Pincus, founder of the three-year-old news and data company, Pincus Co Media. This episode is sponsored by GParency. They're a provider of technology solutions designed to empower commercial property owners and reduce their reliance on certain high cost service providers. This is our 13th live broadcast. The prior episodes are on our YouTube channel. And now I'd like to thank our guests for coming on the show. And I'd like to ask Brandon, what's been the biggest change on how you establish pricing? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I think, you know, it, it definitely differentiates across asset class, location, quality, and being able to think critically about those things is, is important. Uh, the one thing I think to think about really is the buyer pool that you're selling to. Generally speaking, when you're thinking about pricing, the more competitive something will be, the more aggressive you feel comfortable pushing value. Uh, and if you think that something is probably not going to get as much interest, you have to price it even more aggressively to get the attention from the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think when you look at different asset classes, whether that be development, multifamily, retail, office, you have to think about each differently. And I think another thing is within those asset classes, looking at on a building by building basis, I think a lot of people, and I see it all the time, are just, you know, here are my comparable sales. Well, it, well for land, you know, it could be more frontage. It could be a corner, um, which will be different than uh, a mid-block 25-footer. Uh, and also mm -hmm. depends on the location, the neighborhood. Uh, you know, a building in per se, you know, Hell's Kitchen is not going to have the same type of sellouts as the West Village or Chelsea. And I think you have to think about that critically. And then when you also think about rental versus condo, obviously 421A is gone. So how are we looking at that today? Uh, so you really need to be able to price these things for condo development in the multifamily space. Taxes. I, I see a lot of times people compare tax class two buildings to tax class two B buildings. So if you're doing that, you're putting mm -hmm. yourselves behind the eight ball because the tax class two B buildings have a lower total tax annual uh, bill and the price per foot is inevitably higher for the same return. So, and then when you're looking at value add, there's different layout efficiency for units. Um, so there's a lot of different factors in retail. Same thing. What is the quality of the tenant? What is the location? Uh, what is the frontage? So those, how have those things changed in the, the past couple of months? Like, are you basically just kind of across the board, generally lowering the ask to try to create a, a larger buyer pool? Sure. Well, it's all changed actually really quickly over the last couple of weeks, I would say. Um, as we're all aware, interest rates are in flux right now, which has been a dramatic has had a, has had a dramatic impact, you know, even within last week on on what we're doing. And from a yield perspective, we have to price in the increased borrowing costs for these assets. Now, for this again, for retail office multifamily. Now, there's going to be certain assets. A lot of the buildings that we're selling over the last few months, so spring street west 11th street some of these really prime locations we're actually selling to all cash buyers who really just want to park their money in those areas and they're okay with a yield that a buyer that's taking on a lot of debt and needs to respond to investors might be able to take um, again very focused on quality and location 
for the stuff that's a little bit more tertiary, uh, we're definitely seeing a higher yield requirement uh, as interest rates have started to rise. We are also seeing that there's really been, there's been a lot less sales. So we have to price things even more competitively to get the attention of the buyers that are in the marketplace willing to spend. Um, and then we, I want to ask David, who's got a, a, a portfolio or some individual buildings that they're, he's offering for sale. And how, over the past couple of months, did your expectations of price change? And, and what did you do? I mean, I, I, did, did you actually, did you reduce your pricing from your pricing uh, goals like six months ago? Um, well, we didn't uh, reduce pricing. We literally just put these things on the market uh, mm -hmm. with Brandon a couple weeks ago. And, and we're, uh, you know, I've been doing this so long. I'm very realistic on, on what we could achieve and, and what's out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think uh, whatever it's going to be is probably going to be less than what was originally anticipated. Mm -hmm. based upon, you know, interest rates. And, you know, I see it when I'm looking to, to buy properties. I haven't really, I bought a building maybe a couple months ago, but it's been extremely slow on, on the buying front and finding these, um, you know, these types of opportunities because the interest rates have gone up. And I think who's ever going to invest in our deals has become more, uh, more cautious with their money and their stock portfolios dropping, you know, 20 to 30% this year. So a lot of people will borrow against, their uh, securities to uh, buy real estate investments to search for, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10% yield on their, um, on their margin. But right now, if their margin is getting dwindled and the yields are less and we're borrowing at a high, higher rates, then it's just like, that's why just people don't want to invest right now. So it's the same when I go to sell something the people that are looking to buy are, are doing the same thing. And that's why I think, you know, like Brandon said, you know, if you look in the comps, I, I study the comps, um, you know, every two weeks and there's very, very, very few sales in the comps. Uh, but that's also the, the positive for a seller like me, that mm -hmm. the types of buildings that I am selling that are finished product, beautiful apartments, uh, no headaches, no rent regulation, those properties will have a lot of value because there's so few of them available and people will want to, I don't say pay a premium. They'll, they'll pay up for something that has low headaches, fully leased, fully renovated, uh, tax class protected retails leased. The free rent period is over. So there's always going to be people in my opinion that will, um, you know, pay good numbers for this type of, uh, product. Yeah. Just looking back. Yes, sir. Like when you first were starting to think about selling these things, can you put a number, like how much below that original, not that you, you hadn't priced it, but just you thought you were going to get like X and it's now 80%. I think, I think it'll probably be 10% ish. I think Down that's, from and, and, you know, I speak to a lot of uh, top brokers like Brandon, you know, um, and Brandon selling our New York city stuff uh, right now, some of the properties. But I'm hearing, you know, things, people that are in contract, I mean, I'm in contract on a number of properties, you know, the retrades right now are anywhere in the, let's call it five to 20% range. People are mm -hmm. trying to chop the price down based upon the overall economy, based upon where rents are going and based upon, you know, the interest rate on, on a stabilized product is probably in the, in the fives now, five to six. So um, I, I think everything's going to readjust anywhere from the five to 20% and things will just are just pretty slow. Mm -hmm. I think it's just uh, it's slowed down uh, dramatically over the last, you know, two, three months. And hopefully that'll create some opportunities for someone like me in the next, let's call it three to six months, where people, you know, be more of a cash buyers market. And that's what we're, uh, we're preparing for. How, I mean, is the inverse that if there's less of the type of product that you're you're trying to get with the price of that actually go up or there's just like fewer people who have a stomach for that? Um, I don't think the price will continuously go up because the rents, I don't think can keep going up. I mean, we've got some, uh, we got some crazy rents um, over the last you know year since we started leasing the properties. So I think the price of whatever I thought the price is going to be, it's probably going to be down, you know, let's call it 10%, but I don't think I'm going to be down in that 20, 25% range because I'm a, I'm not desperate and B, you know, these things are cash flowing and, um, you know, I think there's always, and, and that's why we went with Brandon because he's always showed that he's able to execute and find the right, 
uh, buyer for this, this particularly this type of um, asset. And, and Brenda, a question on different assets. Are there different, has the interest rate uh, rise impacted different asset classes differently? And can you kind of give an example? Yeah, no, that's a fair question. I think just kind of going back a little bit, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, if you speak to a lot of buyers today, and, and I've spoken to way too many over the last two days, everyone says, you know, I'm on pause for a little bit. I think there's going to be blood in the water because owners that need, you know, when it was COVID, owners that needed to refinance, everyone was work was, you know, was in it together, working together, rates were still low. Let's kick the can a little bit. And now they, you know, the 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 general belief is if I go to refi my building today that I had a, a five-year loan from 2017 when rates were lower, um, I'm going to either have to put equity into the property or I'm going to have to sell. I think it's it's hard to predict. We don't know how long this will last um, in terms of interest rates. Is it going to go up 75, 75, down 25, 25, 25, slowly scales down? Um, the, the challenge you also have is a lot of the LP investors, they are going to want to see higher returns correlate with the higher interest rates. So to what David said, which is a good point, the cash buyers are going to prevail, I think, right now. And I think they're going to see really good opportunities. And I think they're going to be able to acquire really attractive numbers because they're not so focused on what interest rate they are obtaining. Um, I think the other thing, you know, to your question about what's doing better than others, what's impacted most, really anything that's income producing is going to have, is going to, I mean, really every asset class gets impacted if you're looking at interest rates, because whether you're buying retail, office, multifamily, those are all income producing assets for the most part, um, unless you're buying as a user, which is a totally different type of buyer. And, you know, I think we'll still do well on that front, but the higher the interest rate, the more, you know, the higher the borrowing costs, you're going to need to earn a higher return to justify that. So, and then on the construction side, same thing. I mean, is that, does it change a different asset class though? Is there anyone there's at, where they're typically either borrowing more or at a higher rate? You, we will see it equally across in my, in my so, opinion, okay. across all the asset classes. Yeah. I think it has an impact in pricing in every asset class. Um, the, the cash buyers is, are some, are they users or are they also just like any type of buyer? It's, it's a mix. What you'll generally see from the cash buyers for the most part, it's going to be in the, that three to $10 million price point. There's just that many more cash buyers in that bucket mm -hmm. than a $50 million cash buyer. There's just fewer of, of those type of buyers, but you know, an example being two weeks ago, closed a sale on West 11th Street. You know, that was a $16.35 million transaction. That buyer closed all cash. Mm -hmm. um, Thursday, closing a $14.6 million transaction. It's a foreign buyer. They're only taking like 40 to 50% leverage. So these are buyers that are much more focused on parking their money as opposed to my day one return as it relates to the interest rate I'm borrowing at. And who were other, like the, the, the also rands who didn't get it? Are, are they typically also, was it like a bunch of people with all cash and these guys just had the best price or some other people that were putting together sort of a traditional deal and just couldn't get to the same pricing? It's a combination, um, but mostly this is like a specific outlier that was head over heels higher in pricing and also was cash, probably because they weren't borrowing money. Um, I think we are going to see, based on feedback, we are going to see a huge pullback in what people are willing to offer. So, you know, kind of going back to, you know, the last recession where people were taking on negative leverage. Um, I don't, which is when interest rate being higher than the return of the building. I don't think we're going to see that again. I think there's going to be a pause button. It's just confusing because the fundamentals on the property level for sellers they're seeing their rents go up. They're seeing, they're feeling good about things. COVID's getting better. Um, but at the same time, you know, they have people like myself saying, hey, your building value actually went down. Um, it, it's hard for sellers to conceptualize right now. 
why that may be the case, um, where there is there was a lot of transparency in the market between September and February, and then it was just it was easy to understand value. You knew where rents were going, rates were low, and there was just a lot of activity. And we're now into a point where you know Russia invaded Ukraine. We're seeing interest rates rise. The stock market's crashing. There's just fear, and fear causes pause, and pause causes a stalemate in the marketplace. And David, are there? I mean, we've talked about some of these, some of these issues that are impacting pricing. Are there other ones that that are that are not talked about as much, or just sort of other kinds of things that are impacting both the price that you want to sell and then the the price that you're willing to pay? Um, I mean, I think we touched on all the big factors. You know, stock market, interest rates. Um, you know, where rents are going. I just think, like Brandon said, and to reiterate, I think it's just mm -hmm. going to be it's it's going to be a little bit of a slow uh, slow summer. But you know, look, you'll always find that one outlier. You'll always find that diamond in the rough to buy, buying something right now. Hopefully, getting a contract. Um, you know, something that was probably worth more at a at a certain point. And um, you know, you just gotta you just gotta keep going. You know, you just gotta keep. Uh, you know, if you could sell, great. If not, you just, that's where people, I think, are just going to hold their buildings. And a lot of the sellers are going to have this misperception of uh, value. And that usually takes a good six, 12 months for people to, for it to sink in, or they're, they're going to be carrying their building and they just want to cut the cord at some point and say, you know what, I don't want to be cutting this, uh, you know, cutting this check for 20, 30,000 a month anymore. It's, it's, it's time to just, uh, time to just go. So that, Usually, like I said, will probably take a good six, 12 months for it to really sink into people's heads. And it's going to take the experts like Brandon and others to really educate uh, these sellers on on what's happening, because, mm -hmm. you know, you'll have a lot of people just calling the sellers and, you know, saying they could get these crazy prices, which will also just prop the thing, prop these assets right. up, but they'll just never sell. You know, that's just um, that's always usually what happens in this type of market you know, a lot of people are just become desperate and, you know, a lot of people become desperate to try to make deals and try to, you know, sell these sellers uh, something that's not realistic. And then it's just going to keep delaying the, the inevitable further of where pricing really should be at the end of the day. So. If they can think about a broker who maybe over promises, but then at least can get some kind of market together, get a couple of people bidding on it. What happens typically? Just the, the seller is like, hey, that's 40% under whatever, and then just everyone's yeah. home? Something something I focus on is is the the motivation of the seller, the profile. So I would say it's a it's a responsibility of the brokerage community to be honest and not waste people's time. I think we end up doing ourselves a disservice if we overpromise and underdeliver. It's a huge waste of time. I don't fully understand it. An example being today, there's someone I've known for a long time uh, called me and said, hey, I, I do want to sell my building, um, but I need to hit 15 million as like that is my bottom line number. I know in my head there's a 95% chance the building's value is between 13 and 14. I said, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you thinking of me. Mm -hmm. I don't think this makes sense to take on this assignment. As much as I would love to, it's a great building. I know the chances of me striking are very low. And for me, it's it's a it's the opportunity cost of my time, whereas I can be working for clients that are more motivated and realistic. And also I can find other deals that I think I can eventually sell. And it's that's what we have is our time. So I think that that is you know, brokers do themselves a disservice by by chasing something that isn't realistic. Um, and I think in terms of pricing today, we're really in a moment, you know, this podcast or uh, webinar is really happening in a very interesting moment where last week we got hit over the head with a 75 basis point, right. you know, rise in rates for the highest since 1994. We're in, we're in price discovery mode. This is, uh, we're kind of in no man's land right now. And that's okay. Um, but I think what's going to be critical is I think the the brokers and sellers that are going to do the best in right now are going to be the ones that price their assets very competitively. And when I say- oh, If you're trying to get that price though, isn't that the 
Well, so one of the things I'm wondering is like, would you, uh, what do you market the process? Do you run the process differently now because yeah. you're like, and and how is how is that different? And and also, David, do you are you trying to buy properties in a whole different technique? I'll quickly go and I'll leave it there. No. Yeah, we want to price something very aggressively in terms of not overprice it. We want to price it where we really think it can trade, and we want to run a quick process. What that does is at the end of the day, the deeper the buyer pool, so the more competitive the atmosphere is, the better off a seller will be. So by doing this, by pricing it competitively where there's really a lot of eyeballs, there's really a lot of bids coming in on that, we're actually taking, and sorry, David, we're taking control away from the buyers and their ability to kind of wiggle towards the finish line. You know, getting the bid is the easy part. It's actually signing a contract that's hard. And what we need to do is maintain leverage. The only way we can do that is if we have a lot of horses in the race. If we put ourselves in a position where we're overpriced, we're chasing the market down, we're trying to find this one buyer, we will not succeed. So we need that leverage to take the control away from the buyers. And doing that is pricing a building competitively. And okay. David, like, what are you, you have a strategy where you go directly to to sellers and try to get people to, to sell right now. Is that, or in, in general, does that work in this today's market or people are just no way I, I'm not going to. Um, there, there is always activity, always able to find something, but it, it's been a lot slower. There's been a lot, um, you know, it's just the, the opportunities are, are less. We're underwriting so many less deals than we were three, four months ago. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just, and people want uh, way too high of prices, especially now if we're going to underwrite things at a six or 7% interest rate, I mean, forget it. These things right. are, are not going to hit our uh, return matrix because, you know, we have investors. So we need to try to be around a certain uh, return. And if you're going to put in lower, a little bit lower rents, more conservative rent growth and the higher interest rate, not, not, not much is really going to make sense right now. So that's why you know, it's, it's, it's been slow on the underwriting front. It's slow on the purchasing front. It's slow on the selling front. It's mm -hmm. like, I, said, I think it's just going to be a slow three, six months. Um, you know, and, and it's just, uh, it's not going to be as active as, as what it was. And, um, you know, that might create some, uh, some great, um, opportunities. Like we saw a couple of years ago, it's very, it's very possible that people will have to, uh, people will have to sell. Uh, Brenda, I have a, this is a question that, that I don't actually know how this process works. If you put a price at eight and you get people coming in at, at 7.5, 7.56, whatever, that are sort of in a tight range, what do you, what happens after that? Do you say, hey, there's someone, or do you say, give me your next best, or do you have different types of processes? So we definitely have different types of processes. The situation you described is typically when, when buyers hate me, because what I generally will do is I will send out Let's say there were four buyers within a one, two percent price differential. Mm -hmm. I'll send out four blank contracts, no price, no deposit, no closing period. I'll instruct buyers to submit their highest price, their highest deposit, their fastest closing period. And I'll also judge them by the scope of their markup. Mm -hmm. You see which contract comes back without much red ink and the highest price, and you try to get that done as quickly as possible. Again, my job is to keep all of the leverage uh, you know, tied to the seller and making sure that we take the control of the process away from the buyer. Again, people don't love me for that, um, but my fiduciary is to the client. So that's what we do. Um, there's other situations we'll, we'll, we'll call for bids. We'll have like a bid deadline, you know, and we'll see if someone really separate, separates themselves. Um, but a lot of the time when it, it becomes a buyer's market, mm -hmm. it, it's really hard to do anything besides issue multiple contracts um, if there's a tight gap between all the buyers. Because once you, once, you, once you send out one contract, if that buyer flops, you're then going back to everyone else. And there's, there's a stigma attached to doing so. Right? And when you go back to buyers, 
two weeks, three weeks later, they're, they're wondering, Oh, do I have the leverage now? You know, do you, do you say, Hey, we're sending it out to three people or yeah. Oh yeah. Very. I mean, but that's, a, that's a, that's. Yeah. And I, and I also totally understand when someone says, look, I don't want to get into this process. I say, totally understand. Like I respect that decision. I'm doing what I have to do. Right. Um, if, if we're going to send out multiple contracts, it is unethical to not let the different buyers know exactly what's going on. And then as they come back, you don't countersign, your seller doesn't, doesn't countersign other than just the one. And then you can hold on to it or do they have two weeks or like what happens? Do they, the contracts expire? Yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of a race to the finish line for lack of better words. Um, or we'll kind of just pick a horse based on the first markup that we get back. You know, if, if there's one contract that is just littered with red ink and another contract that's looks like very doable to finish in a day or two, we'll, we'll pick that contract and move ahead. Um, again, I think the biggest thing is while you need to maintain leverage, um, I've seen <laughs> plenty of deals die by trying to be too nice. Uh, and then it ends up, burning me or my client, I should say, um, both of us together. Uh, it is important to be respectful, be honest and over communicate in that process because it is, you know, someone's spending time and money and, and I respect and understand that. So it's not that I want to waste their time, waste their money. Um, at the same time, I, I want to close the sale. Uh, that's my job. So it's, it's a fine line of balancing both, both things. And and David, when you're going to try to get a, a buyer kind of on your own, do you, are, are you still trying to even do that right now? Or is it just? No, no, we hire people like Brandon to, uh, you know, educate whether we need the education and also the buyer needs mm -hmm. education. That's why uh, we hired Brandon for. When, when for, you go to buy though, when you're, when you're oh, the buyer. What was the question? Sorry. When, when you're going out to, to a potential seller, do you, um, are you trying to get them comfortable with, with pricing or like, are, are you going out as frequently now or you don't even bother? Oh, we're, we're, no, we're going out, we're making bids, but I think a lot less people um, don't want to hear the, the reality of what's happening you know some people will some sellers will come back to us and then like brandon said you know we might think we have the leverage or these people mm -hmm. some of them just need to get out and don't have time to uh, go through a whole marketing process you know they don't want to spend three months on the market show the property you know they just want a quick quiet uh mm -hmm. sale sometimes there's a lot of family members involved and they want us to go around to the different family members and deal with all the family members individually. And that's where we, um, you know, where we thrive is dealing with the very, very, very difficult people, uh, people that just can't deal with, uh, they can't deal with brokers, they can't deal with attorneys, they can't deal with anyone, but they can deal with, you know, people that are local, that, um, you know, that can move quickly, sign a contract in a day, close very quickly, cash, take it with all the problems and and not, they don't want to, they don't want to, um, you know, mess around. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we build the relationships like, like the brokers do. But when you're pricing that to, to give them just an option to, that you want to buy it, are you getting, are you way off or are you getting closer to their pricing? Uh, right now, I think that a lot of things are just way off. I think mo mm -hmm. most things are way off, but like I said, there's always going to be those one or two things, you know, we're able to just find those one or two situations where uh, I was at a property, um, this wasn't in Manhattan, this is out in the Hamptons. Uh, it it's a family where the one half of the family needs someone to uh, sign a contract quickly, say they'll close cash, take it with all the problems so they could present it to the other half of the family. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no potential for a broker to really get involved in something like that. It's a family dispute where they need the offer. These people have no mortgage. Uh, they make very little money on this property and they're basically running it for the benefit of the family members and they do nothing, but they want to, they want to separate. Mm -hmm. So those are a lot of the situations that, that we um, end up buying from. So, all right. Well, want to wrap it up there and, and thank you both for uh, participating in this. 
Um, and if you'd like to watch or share this later, it'll be on our YouTube channel. And, um, and uh, Brandon and David, thanks so much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.